Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to this event and good morning. Um, my name is, is Christian Blut. I'm a project manager in Bertelsmann Stiftung and I'm in charge of our activities in global economic governance and in particular WTO reform. Um, one of the biggest uh, issues that the global trading system is currently facing uh, is the question of subsidies. Um, as, for example, the Global Trade Alert has illustrated, um, subsidies are uh, the factor actually in the global um, trading system that uh, has been mushrooming since the financial crisis, and that's been creating all sorts of competitive distortions. Nevertheless, subsidies are not per se something evil. Um, they can address market failures and help us, for example, um, get those technologies in place that we really need to tackle climate change. So it's a complicated issue to navigate. How do we deal with subsidies? How do we ensure that competition is fair um, while not throwing out the baby with the bath water? Um, the situation got even more complicated with the COVID-19 pandemic and the widespread use of state aid. And um, as Chad Bowne put this in another webinar that I was part of, we are now all non-market economies. And how do we deal with this fact? How do we address the challenge that comes from um, industrial subsidies in particular, but state aid in general? And how do we make sure that a uh, not so level playing field actually leads to increased animosity between big trading powers, which I think would not be a very constructive thing at the current juncture. So um, I'm, uh, there is a stand-up panel around me uh, to try to help us navigate these big questions, and I very welcome all of our panelists. I'll introduce them in uh, the order of appearance. So we'll first hear from Bernard Hopman, who is a professor at the European University uh, Institute and the director of the Robert Schumann Center for Advanced Studies. And we've been collaborating very closely with Bernard on our activities in WTO reform. And um, by the way, I'm going to post a link in the chat function soon where you find most of our contributions on this. So if you'd like to have a look, you can do that. After that, we will move on to Marian Janssen, who is the new uh, Director for Trade and Agriculture at the OECD. And as I'm sure you're all aware, the OECD has done quite some interesting work on, on subsidies, uh, capacities, and uh, the like. After which, we're going to hear from Xiang Sun Lu, who is a trade advisor and works for, I think, is the mastermind behind Lady Co. Geneva. And finally, uh, Kamala Dawar from the University of Sussex is going to give her an insight into her extensive research on the nexus of subsidies and trade. I very much look forward to all contributions. And after that, we want to have a quite interactive event. So we'll have discussions between the audience, but also the panelists. And I encourage you all to post your questions in the Q&A section, and then I'll try to navigate through them to the best of my abilities before the panelists round it up again uh, at the end of this event. So without any further ado, um, Bernard, the floor is yours. Thanks. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be here um, with all of you this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you might be. Um, as Christian mentioned, I'm going to be speaking to uh, several papers actually which were done as part of a project on WTO reform uh, that was uh, supported by the Bertelsmann Steve Doom and you can so I'm going to uh, I'm going to spare you all the facts and figures and pretty pictures because I'm not going to use a PowerPoint but you can find all of those on the website. Now as Christian mentioned um, we live in a world where <clears throat> governments are increasingly using subsidies for all kinds of reasons. Of course, the major reason today is COVID and to try and keep economies afloat and to keep households uh, afloat as well. But if you look at what's been happening since the global financial crisis ended in 2008, 
what you see is that there's been a steady increase in the use of subsidy-like instruments, right? So these are direct transfers, they're fiscal grants, but increasingly it works through the tax system, through tax exemptions, tax concessions, and through export support type mechanisms. So trade finance, export credit, guarantees. So taking all of that together, uh, the Global Trade Alert has documented that over 50% of all measures taken by governments since 2008 are in that sphere. So despite the fact that we have a tariff man in the White House, the trade policy action is really very much on the subsidy side of the equation. Now, Kamala um, <clears throat> Dawar is going to talk a bit about her work on export uh, credit, export support measures, which are a big part of the story and which are really under-emphasized in public policy discussions. But one implication to draw from this great increase in the use of subsidies is that governments are using all kinds of different instruments to pursue national objectives, but quite frequently those objectives are very similar. Right now, again, COVID is the number one example where governments are facing a common challenge in terms of how do we deal with this. And subsidy type instruments are the appropriate response to that type of a crisis. That's what governments are there for. Of course, different governments have differences in fiscal capacity in terms of what they are able to do, but it is an appropriate instrument in a time like this. Now, most of the discussion on subsidies before COVID hit was about China, what China was doing in terms of its state capitalism model with respect to state-owned enterprises. So that was where a lot of the focus was. But I think if we look back at the Global Trade Alert data, it's a much more general problem, right? So I would like to emphasize that despite what people frequently argue, this is not just a China issue or even primarily a China issue. This is really a global uh, challenge, and we really need to figure out how to revisit the rules of the game for subsidies. And here, the stylized fact, of course, is that if you look at the WTO, which is the main institution that regulates the use of subsidies, kind of in terms of trying to deal with the spillovers associated with the use of subsidies at the national level, those rules are over 30 years old, right? And they were not conceived of the world we live in today. They did not take into account that 50% of world trade actually happens in global value chains. So all these firms are connected. We have plants in different countries producing the same product. So if we think about the incidence of subsidies, it's a much more complicated story than it would have been 30, 40 years ago. The other problem with WTO rules is that they either ban something or they say everything else which is not banned is actionable. So governments can take actions against the subsidy policies of other countries. And that really doesn't make a lot of sense, especially if you take into account that there actually are very good economic rationales for why governments use subsidies. So we really need to move into a situation where there's more scope to differentiate between, if you want, good subsidies, bad subsidies. And the way I would characterize that good, bad, is to really focus on the spillover effect that subsidies have on global trade. Now, the WTO really needs to be at the center of any such efforts because the other, the alternative instruments to do this are really not particularly effective. So the main instrument are regional trade agreements. And of course, if we're talking about policies that create global spillovers, uh, if countries that are part of that uh, activity are not part of a trade agreement, then obviously we're not gonna have much of an effect in, in uh, disciplining that type of behavior. The stylized fact here, of course, is that the large emerging economies are not part of large regional trade agreements. So therefore that instrument really isn't there in any event. So in terms of thinking about rulemaking, I think we really need to focus on dividing the chaff from the corn. And in this case, that means focusing on policies that really create systemic spillovers. Um, and that is something that requires analysis. And what I'll come back to in, in the course of my short uh, presentation talk is that's kind of missing at the moment, right? So we're missing two elements uh, uh, currently. 
we don't really have a comprehensive information base on what actually is going on, what governments are doing. And we don't have anywhere near enough in the way of economic analysis, analysis or economically informed analysis to try and identify which of these very many policies that governments are using are actually a problem for other countries. That requires analysis, documenting and trying to estimate what those spillover effects are. And then the third part of the equation, which is also to a large extent missing at the moment, is to try and differentiate between subsidies that actually promote the global public good, as opposed to subsidies that are really primarily creating competitive spillovers um, on, on other industries, on other countries. Now, this is not new ground for the WTO, and I think it's important to, to recognize this and to think about what happened in the past. So during the year go round, there was an effort made in the negotiation of the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures to try and carve out certain types of subsidies that would be put into the equivalent of what in the agricultural context is called a green box. So subsidies that in principle are okay, and that should not be therefore countervailed. Now that approach was quite narrow, and it really didn't distinguish between subsidies that address global market failures from those that did not. But I think that is a, a step in the right direction. And I think we need to revisit that approach in terms of thinking about developing new rules of the game for subsidies. So what do we need to do very quickly? Because I know we don't have a lot of time. We need to start by strengthening the information base. So currently the best source of information on subsidies globally is the Global Trade Alert. That's an initiative that is being implemented by a very small number of people. It's an independent uh, operation run out of the University of St. Gallen. And I would argue we really need to do much more to collectively harness the international organizations with expertise in this area and give them a mandate to actually do more in the way of collecting that type of information and putting it out there in the public domain. There are precedents for this at the sectoral level and Marion Janssen can talk to this in terms of what the OECD has done in the past on agriculture, which was really has been a very long standing effort to document the support that is actually going to farmers in OECD countries and how that plays out in terms of the effects on consumers and the effects on producers. So we need to do that much more across the board. The current focus, if not obsession, of the United States is on industrial subsidies. And I think that is also kind of looking into the past. We live in a services world. So therefore, when we think about looking at the kind of documenting where these subsidies are, we need to include the services sectors, right? We are increasingly moving to a digital economy. So it's no longer an industrial manufacturing uh, story. Who should be responsible for kind of strengthening that information base is a very important question, right? So the WTO has increasingly done less to actually document subsidies. And partly that's a result of political pressure. Some WTO members are not particularly keen on the collection of this type of information. So I would argue, and this is, ex this is, uh, this is elaborated much more in the papers <clears throat> that uh, are on the Bertelsmann Stiftung website, is we need to leverage this in and using the other international organizations. So maybe a more appropriate focal point is the G20, and in particular, harnessing the Trade and Investment Working Group to make that one of the activities of that group. That Trade and Investment Working Group brings together not just G20 members, but the World Bank, the IMF, the OECD, the WTO, UN organizations, and those really are the best placed organizations to work on this collectively, and that would also kind of take the burden and the pressure off the WTO. With the WTO, of course, the WTO Secretariat is part of this equation. That type of exercise, I would argue, needs to lead towards a plurilateral initiative among countries, not necessarily all the G20 members, but I don't see much scope for a multilateral initiative at the moment to kind of rethink the subsidy rules. It needs to start with the large countries. If the large countries do not agree on a path forward, then anything else you might try to do in the WTO on a multilateral basis 
is not going to go anywhere. In practice, that means the United States, the European Union, Japan, China, India, the big countries in the world economy, they are going to have to agree um, on the path forward. A necessary condition for even starting that type of discussion is to have this information base, and not just that information, but also analysis that is done on the basis of the information that is being collected, again, to document what really matters, where are their systemic spillovers, what should those countries be focusing on when they're thinking about rules. So that's just in conclusion, we all, all governments use subsidies. It's a perfectly appropriate instrument for, for governments to use. And you could actually argue that's one of the functions of our government. It is to address market failures, which we have of all different types, both national, but also international, global. Think about climate change. There is no way we're going to achieve the climate change objectives that governments have set out for themselves without the use of tax subsidy instruments. So that's just one example of where we need to kind of develop a framework to identify what actually should be permitted, right? So if we have a WTO regime that says you're not allowed to use subsidies if those subsidies are actually reducing the carbon footprint of countries, well, then I think we have a problem, right? So there really is a need to revisit the rules. And again, identifying what really moves the needle, what is important in terms of competitive spillovers versus what subsidies are trying to do is important. We need to start with action to improve the information set available, and we need to complement that with analysis. Analysis can be done by independent analysts. It doesn't necessarily have to be done by the international organizations, but those independent analysts cannot create this data themselves. Right? So the Global Trade Alert has done what I think is really a heroic effort at documenting where we are, but there's a lot missing. There's a lot more that needs to be done uh, on this front. Let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Bernard. Um, we have one paper that um, uh, I find personally particularly interesting, which looks into the debate about agricultural subsidies in the 1980s and um, what that has done for, for trade policy and what lessons we can learn maybe for the current debate. And one thing that was very prominent from this paper with it by Bob Wolf is that the transparency work done by the OECD was actually very helpful um, for trade negotiators to develop disciplines around agricultural subsidies. So I'm very much looking forward to hear from Marion Janssen and the work that is being done at the OECD right now. Marion, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Christian, and thank you very much for having me uh, here. Um, indeed, at the OECD, we have for many years been working on the issue of subsidies, and we have very much been doing this, I believe, in a spirit of saying you can't discipline what you can't measure. So knowing what you're talking about is a first step in order to be able to address whatever you would like to address. And we started already um, 30 years ago with our work on agricultural subsidies, but we are also working on fishery subsidies, fossil fuel subsidies, and very recently also on the use of subsidies in industrial goods. Um, but I would like to start by picking up some of the points made by uh, Bernard. And um, he made the point that we are talking here about, when it comes to subsidies, about a global issue, about an issue spanning multiple sectors, and I think I uh, raised this uh, already, and about a long-standing issue. And um, and I think when you would, when you think about how many cases there have already been at the WTO, this is one of the issues you see. Subsidies and the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures has been one of the most referred to um, um, agreements in in the WTO subsidy in the WTO case history of the close to 600 cases at the WTO that were brought to the institution. Around one fifth dealt with the SEM agreement. Another around one fifth makes reference to anti dumping, which is very close. 
and you have to take into account that the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures does not even deal with agricultural services. So this is only about what is not agriculture and services. So this is a long-standing issue and an issue that has been haunting, let's say, the organization because we have not had enough, as, um, as Bernard says, not enough evidence and not a good enough understanding of how to handle subsidies. But I will get to back to that later. Some of the difficulties uh, um, can be illustrated by um, the following anecdote. I was over 10 years ago working at the WTO. We were working on a report on the issue of subsidies and we were looking at subsidies in the services sector and, um, and notably at the transport sector. And unfortunately, one of the countries that popped out as a heavy subsidizer of transport was Switzerland, the host country. I can say this because it, it, was, it appeared like this in the report. And Switzerland was not happy about appearing as a heavy subsidizer, and they made that visible in a newspaper article. But why did Switzerland appear as a heavy subsidizer? That was because the country had privatized the transport sector. It was private but received subsidies. In many other countries that appeared in the same table, transport was public or semi-public. And what the public money was that went into a public entity, we couldn't measure. So you would arrive at this um, contradictory finding that the country where the sector was opened most and privatized most would appear as the most interventionist country. And this, I think, shows uh, to which extent it is difficult to assess, and we already knew that it is difficult to assess how to deal with public bodies, how to deal with state-owned entities. That was already an issue in services and is now potentially also an issue in industrial goods. So we knew it was difficult. We knew it was going to become a bigger and bigger problem with China entering the WTO. And here another anecdote around 15 years ago, a uh, private sector consultancy approached me and said, Marion, we expect an explosion of cases between uh, the United States and China. Wouldn't you want to set up a business in Geneva to deal with those cases at the WTO? So private sector already so 15 years ago that the cases around subsidies would increase. And that was without that, that was before the financial crisis and before COVID-19. And as Barnard said, these two incidents have led to more and more intervention by governments and to somebody like Chad saying, you refer to this, Christian, that all governments are currently intervening in markets. Now, so a long-standing issue, an issue that the WTO has been struggling with and an issue that will continue to be difficult to solve. Bernard made reference to some of the reasons. He said, in order to deal appropriately with the subsidies issue at the WTO, we will need to be able to distinguish between subsidies that help to pursue what in WTO language we call legitimate policy objectives, environment, public health, for instance, universal access, and subsidies that pursue more competitive um, objectives that would be have a more distortive character in the market and that we would consider less in line with the WTO spirit. But making that distinction, to which extent is the design of a subsidy going towards uh, meeting a legitimate policy objective or towards distorting markets, making that distinction is very difficult. And it's also something that has been wanting the system for a long time. Bernard made reference to the fact that the WTO rules are relatively old. One of the results of this is that the decision between what is legitimate and not is often being taken in disputes by the dispute settlement panel. And this is a difficult and very challenging issue. I can, I can tell you by experience when you are advising a case and you have to see, you make a decision a certain R&D subsidy, educational subsidy, environmental subsidy is distortive or not. It is an, a difficult and scary exercise. And for now, it's very right that we do not have enough analysis and not enough guidance in order to make these distinctions. In my view, there is an additional difficulty 
In the field of subsidies, you move very, you are very close to the field of finance. You are moving between trade and finance as an economist and also in terms of ministerial responsibilities. Setting different taxes for different companies or for different sectors is something that in many countries is considered to be something that falls under the responsibility of the finance ministry. It's not a trade issue. It's not a trade minister, ministry issue, but it affects trade. So we're in the interface between the responsibilities of different ministries, and that's also where countries struggle with the decision what should be monitored or uh, decided where, notably in which, and discussed where, in which, notably in which international institution. Let me finish by making reference to the work done at the OECD. We have indeed, as Bernard has already mentioned, been working for many years on, uh, on the issue of increasing transparency and providing more data on the field of subsidies. I already said we started around 30 years ago to work on agricultural subsidies. We regularly um, publish data on over 50 countries, so that goes beyond the OECD membership. And you will see there that we report that there are hundreds of billions of dollars, around 600 every year spent on agriculture and subsidy. But this transparency indeed allows countries to compare what they are doing and to assess where changes may be necessary or useful. Fisheries, 33 countries in our database. Uh, we, um, from our latest data, we find that is around 10 to 13 billion dollar a year spent on subsidies in that sector. Fossil fuels, we have data on 76 countries, and here again we are on a, diff uh, a different level of magnitude, around 370 billion US dollars a year being spent on, these, uh, on this sector. These are the sectors where we are able, with the help of national entities, to collect data on particular sectors. Where things become more complex, and we'll now refer to this already, is when you're looking at industry and defect along a value chain. And we have in recent uh, years started to um, put more effort on understanding how subsidies or aid works through a value chain from the upstream suppliers through the value chain to the downstream supplier in the final market. We have produced work on aluminium, we have produced work on semiconductors. And here, rather than working with data from public entities, we have to work with firm level data, with information from firms on their financial statements that provide us information on how much um, funding or assistance or preferred credits have been received by the governments. And that's a, bit, a lot of nitty gritty work that is often value chain specific. So how the aluminum value chain doesn't work like the semiconductor chain. So that requires industry expertise and a lot of detailed work. What we find is that in um, aluminium, and um, we see a lot of uh, activity by state-owned enterprises, but we also see a lot of the use of market credit, uh, of credits that where the uh, conditions are below market conditions. We see the same thing happening in semiconductors. In semiconductors, we see a lot of activity around R&D subsidies. It's the kind of subsidies where it's then difficult to assess what is legitimate and what is not. I leave it here, uh, maybe uh, again concluding that as OECD, we stand ready to continue to help members to measure what is going on in terms of subsidies. And we help, we believe that this is a first step and an important step in the direction to understand how to discipline these kind of measures. Thank you very much. That was a uh, very interesting. Um, China is a country that is frequently criticized for its use of, of subsidies and state aid. Um, and yet, in the course of the COVID crisis, at least, we have all become a little bit like China. And as Marianne Janssen has said, uh, most governments, if not all, use subsidies in one way or another. So I'm very happy that we have uh, Xiang Kun Lu here, who is a uh, traveler between worlds and who can help us to make sense uh, of the Chinese use of uh, industrial subsidies, of 
what maybe we can learn from China or to what extent we can actually engage China to find uh, a way to organize uh, subsidies and state aid in a way that uh, creates less animosity in the global trading system. Lou, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, thanks to be here. Uh, the, maybe uh, I, I did not prepare for China's story here. <laughs> uh, the, but uh, but uh, for me... You don't have to. <laughs> uh, uh, but <laughs> maybe a few words to start. Uh, the thing is that as a formal negotiator on behalf of China and a still a close observer of what is happening on subsidies and other issues, probably what I can say is that, of course, China is not immune to subsidies, as, trade, uh, as Bernard has mentioned in the beginning, uh, uh, indicated by the Global Trade Alert. Uh, and, of course, uh, I'm also doing business in China. I'm also an investor. And I do see that in China, uh, the national, regional level, that there are uh, such an issue there at, at uh, all the governmental level, different layers. But of, of course, as also Bernard has said, and also as indicated by the Global Trade Alert, uh, this kind of phenomenon is not a China issue, it's general, it's global. And it's not only a pervasive during the uh, COVID-19, but a, a long-standing issue even before that. We do see that that uh, in the U.S. we see a lot of uh, state-level subsidies. In the EU, also see a lot of member states or even lower the, uh, the member states' uh, level of subsidies, so on and so forth. So, yeah. So, to cut a long story short, uh, I think that the uh, all the at least big players are there and so so that brings me to what i want to say probably uh, both bernard and mary has shared a lot about the facts and also the way forward uh, so i could uh, uh, probably uh, uh, complement to what they said by focusing on on one of your question how uh, can the WTO move forward on this uh, the first thing i want to say about the big players and the Please, for any of you who have uh, heard me saying too much about this, uh, allow me, forgive me for repeating what I have said at many occasions, because I think this is a kind of issue behind all the difficulties uh, in the WTO, uh, including our subsidies. So I very much agree with Bernard and others saying uh, that, that for any international subsidy regime to be uh, meaningful, it needs engagement uh, with the big three, so China, US, and EU, and some other major players. Uh, it is also true that, um, as indicated by uh, Bernard's uh, paper and also some other writers uh, on the Bedesman Stephen, is that many as aspects behind the subsidy uh, such as state-owned enterprises uh, and state-owned banks and government-run industrial policies uh, reflect very much the systemic difference among the major players, uh, hence uh, are highly uh, politically sensitive. So, therefore, the focusing on the spilling over effects should be the way forward, technically. Uh, but also you need a candid uh, political dialogue, so that's where I'm going to repeat myself. Uh, you need such a dialogue to see when, whether the major players can accept the coexistence of such a systemic differences, without which uh, I don't think there's any possibility to, to in, embark on a meaningful discussion on subsidies. So what I uh, have heard a lot in China, the thing is that uh, by trying to attack China on the state of enterprises, on the subsidies, uh, the worries of the people there is that, okay, are you talking about uh, the apple tree in my garden? Because the branches go into your garden, so cause some problem concerns. Or are you really looking at the house there and you try to tear, tear down everything? So that's kind of political concern, uh, per, quite pervasive uh, among many Chinese. So I think that uh, you, you, need, you, you really need a kind of political dialogue uh, uh, like that and to make sure that you start to understand each other, what's your target and how to deal with it. And then you start to, to build a kind of political confidence or trust. Uh, and especially, I think, uh, between the US and China. Uh, otherwise, it's hard to foresee a fruitful discussion uh, within the WTO on industrial subsidies. Uh, we don't know whether it's going to be possible, but you have to do it anyway. Uh, 
uh, this dialogue could take place in G20 or through any bilateral channels or, or even a WTO kind of informal ministry or something like that. We have proposals coming up uh, by uh, in, uh, saying that ministers should interact more uh, informally in Geneva. So I think that could be part of the dialogue. And one thing interesting here, I think that uh, that uh, that uh, of course people are saying that Trump is trying to to push and doing a lot to to push China to reform, uh, but to simply put it in the situation like it is now and to take the state of enterprises uh, as an example, what Trump administration by really targeting Chinese system and attacking Chinese system uh, 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 is pushing China towards the opposite direction. Uh, Bernard and Marion all know that uh, for, for decades, China has been uh, doing a lot to reform its state-owned enterprises uh, since the late 80s and early 90s. But right now in the China, we see an opposite direction. Uh, and the Chinese, uh, the government is really consolidating the state-owned economies uh, uh, instead of trying to further reform it, which is attacked by many, not only guys, including we uh, as the Chinese uh, scholars. So I think uh, we have to really reflect upon this and uh, before we can uh, do any meaningful WTO discussion. The other thing is that uh, uh, I agree with Bernard and also the papers that uh, you also need to look at uh, the objective of such this as a policy in instrument and recognize sometimes the legitimate role of at least, at least certain types of subsidies when they promote public good. This could include uh, the uh, so-called green subsidies, which promotes climate change and so on and so forth, but also support by developed countries or in infant or, or strategic sector, uh, or support uh, during the crisis like 2008 and also now the pandemic uh, uh, crisis. But uh, of course, related criteria has to be established uh, 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 on these subsidies, good ones, but also how to monitor them. Are they used as they are designed? Uh, uh, have they already served the purpose? Should be scaled out, uh, 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 so on, so so forth. Uh, uh, the third point is that uh, you, every picture has two sides. When we criticize one country uh, for its subsidy policies to develop one sector or promote one sector or develop one technology, have we thought about uh, uh, why do they do that? How to deal with other countries? that abuse uh, national security concerns by prohibiting technology transfer through meaningful uh, or normal, uh, through normal commercial transactions. The obvious example would be the recent US sanction on China uh, uh, on the chips. Uh, China used to import something like 300 billion US dollars of chips, mainly from the US. But with the sanction, China is right now pouring billions and billions of US dollars to develop its own chip industry. Uh, some, some of these measures, of course, are arguably characterized uh, uh, as subsidies with uh, obvious negative spill, spilling over effects on many other countries who produce chips. Uh, but many in China simply argue that you cannot ask someone to tie to, uh, his hands while some, someone else is stabbing uh, him with, uh, with a knife. So that's, that's how they, 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 they describe it. The last point I want to make, I agree very much with uh, Bernard and Marion saying that service, uh, service subsidies should also be uh, one part of this uh, discussion. And that's becoming more and more apparent. And it's starting to become a kind of issue of that the rich and capable ones can do it, but the poor and vulnerable ones cannot. So that creates a um, level uh, playing field. But the other thing is that not only service subsidies, how about agricultural subsidies? I mean, it is a long-standing issue how to deal with it, how to put it together. Uh, I, I do not mean that we need to necessarily try to link things together and to make trade-offs. But one simple question members could always ask is that uh, when you try to put into cage a dog uh, which is causing problem in the past few days, how about uh, the other dog who is causing a much bigger problem in the past few years? So I think that's the one thing we also need to reflect upon for any politicians uh, to sell any uh, results back at home. So I will stop it there. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much, Lou. And uh, let us now turn to our final panelist, 
uh, Kamala Dawar. I understand you've done quite a lot of research, especially on export subsidies. So I'm very much looking forward to uh, your contribution. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Actually, this research has come out of a project that Bernard has been um, managing uh, from the Horizon 2020. And I've been looking at official export credit support. And this actually is a textbook example of what Bernard was talking about and also what the other speakers have mentioned um, to illustrate how the rules are no longer fit for purpose with regard to export official export subsidies. Now, export credit support from governments is designed to fulfill a financing gap uh, most trade and services uh, needs to be supported by loans or guarantees or insurance. And this will ensure the safe passage and delivery of, of the good and service. Now, uh, the commercial sector is really the, uh, the area that should be supporting this, uh, this trade. But in crises such as COVID, 2008 crisis, there was a lot of liquidity problems. And so government official export credit agencies stepped forward to support the trade because we there was a you know a global meltdown as we remember now uh, so they've got a really important uh, role to play as a lender of last resort uh, when there's these market failures however what we've seen is such dramatic changes in the official export credit market since the crisis uh, governments didn't actually ECAs didn't actually retreat back into the shadows as lenders of last resort governments now saw them as a really important tool of industrial policy and as countries get richer, they'll start to use these tools. So, of course, China, India, South Africa, uh, all st have started to enter this uh, arena. Now, the thing is, the regulatory framework was really designed um, around the traditional industrial nations, around the OECD countries. So, the OECD arrangement uh, was pretty successful in regulating these export subsidies to support trade. Um, However, the new members are not a part of the OECD arrangement, and this has caused a kind of disruption to the market and competitiveness within the market. So even the arrangement members, participants, they're having to uh, devise and recalibrate activities outside of the arrangement so they can actually compete with the non-arrangement export credit agencies. So this has been uh, a problem for the OECD, but also a problem for the WTO, because the WTO is left to kind of deal with the non-OECD participant export credit agencies to make sure that their support is not a subsidy. And we have all these problems. We have non-transparency. It's very hard to see what's happening at a transactional level. The reporting is basically self-reporting by governments through annual reports. Even in the EU, <clears throat> the European Commission relies on self-reporting from the member states, even though they are OECD members and it's been transposed as a hard law into the EU. Um, and a lot of these subsidy, we could say, do we know it's a subsidy race? Well, it, it looks like it could be. Um, there's a, a due, dil due diligence problem for countries operating outside of the OECD. They have less restrictions on environmental, social, uh, human rights and debt financing obligations. We can't really tell if they're market rates. And the real problem here is they are supposed to do it, be doing something the commercial sector can't do. So it's called additionality. Now, how do we calculate additionality when there's so much non-transparency? Um, when I ask various uh, eminent people in the OECD and within uh, different export credit agencies, there doesn't seem to be a very kind of coherent or transparent way of looking at additionality. And indeed, if you look at the US, which has the most transparent checklist of what additionality is, in there is competing with another ECA. So we have this race that's based on credit uh, terms and conditions rather than the price and the quality of the good and service itself. Subsidies agreement doesn't cover services. Subsidies agreement is bad notification. Subsidies agreement is based on bilateral enforcement. I'm, if I'm in a glass house, I'm not going to throw a stone at you. Um, so really, we have this problem with gaps that we're talking about all the way through. Um, <clears throat> spillovers, we don't know what's going on with global value chains. Litigation, very low. Does, we don't know if it's countervailable. So we're in a situation where we actually need to either have a successor arrangement to the OECD, which includes the big players. So there's got to be something in it for them. Um, or G20, we have an international working group. And I'll just finish off by saying that until the trade, um, until the trade war, 
apparently there were a lot, lot, lot of progress, particularly on the Chinese side. So the trade war has really ruined a lot of very fruitful negotiations between high level policymakers who are really committed to make this work. Um, and it soured the atmosphere for a lot of things. So I'll just stop there. Thank you very much. And um, actually, what, you, what you've just said sort of resonates with what I heard in a podcast a couple of days ago, wherein goes in Kondri Vela, one of the contenders to become the next PG of the WTO, spoke about the necessity to, um, to uh, tackle imbalances in trade finance. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's sort of just an immediate connotation, I think, to that, which I find very interesting and which uh, underlines how timely this issue. Um, I would like to invite our audience to post questions in the Q&A section. We have one question so far, and don't worry, I would have personally many questions, but this session should not be about me, it should be about you, so please uh, make use of the, the Q&A function. So the first question we have is from uh, Ronald Steenblank, and uh, he has a question regarding climate-friendly uh, subsidies, especially those uh, linked to the production of uh, equipment um, and uh, rules that would provide a safe harbor for such. And to what extent those would actually contrast um, in, or, sorry, I, I got a bit lost in the question, um, uh, be confounded with some of the issues that would have made part negotiations on environmental goods difficult, mainly, namely the dual use of many goods. So would any of the panelists like to come forward to comment on this question? I see the hands of, of uh, Marianne Janssen and Bernard. So maybe uh, Marianne Janssen goes first and then we turn to you, Bernard. Um, yeah, this question goes very much to the core of one of the issues I mentioned before, this distinguishing between the legitimate policy objectives and other policy objectives. And if you want, uh, in, in rules or in a decision-making uh, process in a dispute settlement case, for instance, you don't only have to decide whether a legitimate objective may have been pursued, but also to which extent and whether the policy you have used is the one that is best suited, least trade distortive, in order to pursue that legitimate objective. And um, as I've argued in, in, in previous published uh, work, notably the work with Joost Powerlane on the use of economics in trade disputes, uh, we as eco economists are not advanced enough to provide precise answers to this. And one big problem we have is measuring the extent of the uh, externality or of the market failure that uh, the policy, in this case a subsidy, wants to address. So Bernard's call for more analysis in addition to more data, I wish to very strongly support it. Distinguishing between these two dual uses is the tricky thing and we should not underestimate this. Bernard, do you want to? Yeah. Yeah, so to, to so like like Marianne said, this is a really messy area. Right? So I think the one point I would make with respect to the, the way the question is framed, which is, you know, isn't there a problem with giving safe harbor for certain types of uh, subsidies that pursue certain types of objectives? There is. And I think that is why I think hard rules of the type that lawyers like, right, right, black lines, I think is not the way to think about how we kind of support cooperation in this area. So I think we need to start more from first principles in the sense of where do we share common objectives, right? So if, if there is a common objective in terms of dealing with climate change, then what we really need to do is to take that seriously, assume good faith, and actually create much more in the way of platforms where you can have a dialogue about what is the effect of the policies that country A is pursuing. 
Right. So I think we might need to change quite a bit of the of the mindset in terms of how we think about uh, cooperation, whether it's plurilateral, multilateral. Where instead of saying, you know, it's and, and and I think it is also something where economists have not been particularly useful in terms of the models and the way we think about trade agreements, because trade agreements in in the way that most economists nowadays think about it, it's really all about a political economy story where we're trying to discipline domestic interest groups and governments can't do it, so they tie their hands in a trade agreement. Or it's really about internalizing spillover. So it's all about terms of trade <coughs> externalities. And I don't think that's a particularly useful approach towards thinking about many of these types of issues. So before we start writing hard rules, we need to actually think about do we want hard rules? Are hard rules really going to be useful in broad classes of kind of collective action problems that the world faces today? And we really should maybe perhaps be thinking about other frameworks to actually think about supporting cooperation. And again, the only way that is going to work by having a good information base, by having the analysis, but also by having governments around the table who are willing to interact with each other, right? And in the current environment, that might seem like a really big stretch, right? So as Kamala mentioned, there is a lack of trust at the moment, a lot of the goodwill that was in the area that was being kind of um, on which a lot of the work on export credit agencies and potential disciplines was based on has disappeared, right? So that, that really is an important necessary condition for all of this to work. But I wouldn't get too depressed either about the prospects for that, right? So we've had an effort along these lines in the, the global forum on steel excess capacity, right? Which independent of where that ended up, showed that at least the large players were willing to sit around the table for at least three years until that particular program ended, which was actually doing a lot of, so what is actually going on? Establishing that information base, connecting with the private sector and the firms involved in that particular industry and thinking about, okay, so where are the, uh, where are the problems? Now, one of the downsides of the Global Steel Forum, to my mind, was there wasn't enough analysis, right? And there wasn't enough analysis because the parties around the table didn't want to have that done. And I think that was, that was a mistake. In terms of being a bit positive about the prospects for this, um, and especially the prospects for this kind of uh, less legalistic uh, approach towards supporting um, cooperation, we see quite a bit of that already, both in the WTO and outside the WTO, right? So outside the WTO, this takes the form of international regulatory cooperation, where sectoral regulators actually get together. Uh, think about the International Competition Network, which is a network of competition agencies around the world who regularly talk to each other, who try to work out what actually makes for good practice. So that could be a potential model to think about, well, as Marion mentioned, of course, you cannot talk about subsidies if you don't rope in ministries of finance, right? I mean, this is not at all an agenda for trade ministries. So you need to bring in the right actors, but the trade people need to be there as well because this is a trade issue. So think about platforms like that. Uh, is, it, is it conceivable to think about a platform where you connect the ministries of finance, maybe with the competition agencies? Because of course, the way this is dealt with in the EU if we think about state aid, it's a competition issue, right? And we have DG competition and there are big, you know, they obviously are centrally part of how the European Union thinks about managing spillover. So I think we really need to go towards a different model, which is much more based on economics um, and which recognizes what governments are trying to do, uh, which is not, and I think this is part of the problem we're in at the moment is um, so, I should be uh, transparent here. I'm an economist, right? So, <laughs> but I think the lawyers have taken over too much in this particular domain. And that's when you get into, like Marion said, because we don't have these other systems. So what do you do? You start a dispute settlement case, right? And of course, lawyers love to litigate. I mean, that's how they get paid. And I think it's been, it's, I think it's been very counterproductive. One last point on this, I'm talking too long. I think we also need to keep in mind that there are other areas of WTO 
principles and rules that are really important and that can help address some of the questions, some of the issues that are raised in the question. So think about national treatment, right? National treatment is a fundamental rule of the WTO. Now, if we could get countries to say, well, whatever I'm doing, I'm not going to discriminate in favor of domestic firms if I'm providing subsidies, that might actually take care at least of part of the problem, right? So I think this other dimension of fundamental principles that should apply, we shouldn't lose sight of, right? So fundamental principle number one, transparency. But I think if we can also apply some of the rules of the game that everybody has already agreed to in the WTO to subsidies, that could also make a big difference. Now, of course, the gap was written to say national treatment does not apply to subsidies. So I think that's another element of the discussion. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, is, uh, does any of the other panelists want to come in on this question? All right. Um, so we, we have another question, which is actually, I think, quite quite related to what Bernard already said. Um, the, the question is from Peter Parmentier, and he says um, that uh, many of the current problems in the WTO related to subsidies and SOEs touch upon other policy areas, industrial policy and competition policy, and uh, will a reform of uh, the trading system and trade rules be sufficient to tackle these issues? Um, so maybe I would I would like to add a question of my own to that, which is quite related. I think we see two trends right now. There is an increased resource recourse to industrial policy that usually relies on some form of subsidy. Um, so there is a real uh, possibility that what we see ahead for the near future is an increased arms race in industrial policy amongst the major players. Or at the same time, given the amount of money that governments are spending on COVID-related measures, that actually fiscal space to engage in such an arms race will diminish. And that might create a political window of opportunity to think about discipline. So, in which direction do you think, think things moving are, quite simply put, are things going to get worse or are they going to get better? Um, and who, anyone know who likes, please feel free to jump in. Well, the first, the question about will a reform of the trading system be sufficient, you know, these things are always it's a moving train, so we always have to revise and renew and reform our, our rules to keep up with what's going on. So I think it should be about, uh, as Bernard said, creating new mechanisms for uh, engaging with uh, current and contemporary issues in a sort of open-minded way and in a sort of non-zero-sum manner. Um, <clears throat> There is a there is a, a rationale for having more plurilateral agreements uh, with subsidies because of the fact that it's you know you have to have a certain amount of cash as a government to be able to engage in this race, and there is um, a, a good rationale for having cooperation over subsidies. I think a lot of it is really about the politics and about um, allowing policy makers who have the information who know where to look to have more say in in trade policy at the moment. It seems that trade policy has been taken over by uh, foreign affairs and international relations and, and political um, objectives. And that's that's the heart of the matter at the moment, actually. Trade is not based on rational policy making to the best of our understanding. Um, yeah, Chris, can I? Yeah, no, I, I think that's a good question. Uh, I think uh, this is, of course, a serious issue. I mean, subsidies uh, create more than, more, pro more problems than uh, spilling over effects. So domestically, it also uh, creates what Bernard just said about this kind of national treatment uh, thing. I mean, between different players, uh, private, uh, public, uh, and also foreign investors. And uh, of course, uh, that's, that's a serious issue. Uh, first thing is, of course, WTO has to move ahead. Uh, I mean, but WTO cannot uh, move ahead simply by designing new rules uh, purely with hard laws, as Bernard has said. I think 
what he said about basic principles, transparency, all this is, should play in, and different committees should also come in, the service council uh, and SEM uh, committee and the goods council, all these things should have a role, uh, important role in there to play. But the other thing is that about the, what we always discuss about the sectarian role uh, under the WTO reform, do we give sectarian more kind of uh, scope to play, a more proactive role, or do we, do what we are doing now by really tight their hands and uh, uh, for, forbid forbidden them to do anything until all members say you can do something. No, I don't think that's a documentation, transparency, working together with OECD, G20 Trade Investment Group, and many other international organizations. Also, uh, financing part uh, or have to play. Uh, Plurilateral, Kamala has just said, I think that's also something we need to at least uh, kind of to, to start a discussion should be among the major players. So that's more or less a plurilateral thing. But the RTS should also be in, in, in the game. I mean, many RTS begin to touch upon industrial policies, you know, enterprises, so on and so forth. So that's also something there. Uh, so I think that uh, that it really needs a, a, a much global context uh, within the WTO, but also beyond WTO to really move things ahead. I think that's a, that's a way probably uh, to, to combine the hard law and soft law and different platforms to move things uh, uh, ahead together. Thank you. Good. Do we have any other comments from the panel? Right on. Obviously not enough, right? So that's 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 pretty clear. Um, so I I would uh, agree with the other panelists that, and, I, and just to reiterate what I said before, I don't really see us moving collectively forward on on kind of thinking about uh, cooperation on subsidies, which uh, doesn't also include some element of antitrust competition policy type thinking and principles, right? So and I think that that is, if, if, if nothing else, it's needed because of the, um, a, the need to deal with this problem of state-owned enterprises, right? So that's, that, that has to be part of the equation. And doing that on a multilateral basis, I really don't see that happening uh, anytime soon. On, on the uh, industrial policy <coughs> question and a potential arms race here. So clearly the fiscal constraint is gonna bite uh, at some point, yes. But I don't think, so I think when, when we think about industrial policy, I would make a distinction between two types of, of angles. One is the, uh, uh, surrounds a lot of the talk we're reading about today, which is all about, we need national champions again. We can't, we need to diversify, we need to reshore, uh, we can't trust trade, um, which has not just a small, but a pretty big protectionist tint in terms of the thinking behind that, right? So that, that's one area. But I think if we think about industrial policy, the way, it has evolved in the last 20 years or so, it is less and less kind of directly tied to subsidies, right? So the old style industrial policy thinking where you throw a lot of money at a particular sector that you want to develop is really kind of now widely considered, I think both in OECD countries, but as much, if not even more in developing countries as something which is a very outdated way of thinking about industrial policy. Right, so the modern industrial policy is really trying to figure out where are their coordination problems which prevent a particular industry which could develop from actually growing? And how do you put in place systems to actually identify what those coordination problems are? And yes, there will be an element where governments need to provide public support for certain types of activities, but it's much more granular and it's much more endogenous. It's based on information which is generated by players in a particular activity, right? And those players are not just the firms, but the suppliers, communities, and so forth. And I think what we've seen in the industrial policy area in terms of doing it right, goes very much in the direction of what I was advocating in terms of how we should deal with subsidies more generally, which is you need to have a platform to actually figure out what are we trying to do? What are the, what are 
the, the effects of what we're trying to do. And I think the, the difference between the industrial policy kind of mode of cooperation, which I think is actually superior to the way we're thinking about subsidies, is in the industrial policy context today, you're focusing on a particular problem, right? What are we trying to do here and how do we do it efficiently? And I think that kind of thinking also needs to be brought in to the subsidy uh, arena. So let me let me stop with that. I think I also saw Marion Janssen's hand. So if you'd like to, the floor is yours. Yeah, I would uh, like to come back to um, the, the, the two questions. Actually, um, the number of points. Well, first, um, I do would also support that uh, we will have to think first disciplinary within economics uh, when uh, looking at the subsidy issue. And Bernard made an important point here when referring to the state aid rules of the European Union. Uh, when um, already some time ago at the WTO, we looked at, when I was working at the WTO, into subsidies issues for the World Trade Report, we compared um, the state aid rules, the EU state aid rules, with uh, the uh, WTO agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. And we considered them um, related uh, tools for to, that wanted to address the same problem. But as Bernard says, indeed, this is a tool that falls at the EU level very much under the competition authority and the state aid rules are very close to, um, they, they set rules for the finance ministries. They set rules on what you can and cannot do in terms of setting taxation, notably for enterprises, national enterprises or enterprises coming from abroad. So here we see this crossover of disciplines or ministries, competition, finance, um, trade. Um, oh, again, also uh, from my dispute settlement experience on a typical case, we would have to look at industrial organization literature, industry specific literature, competition policy literature, accounting information, and actually we would very rarely use trade economy, trade policy literature because that was uh, giving too little information on how to address um, a case. And here is where I do not agree with Bernard. I think uh, when he says that we should, we need more economists and less lawyers, I think about what we need better economists. Economists with a different type of education than I had. We have to be able and prepared to think much better across and more across uh, disciplines within economics. And I would like to finish with Passing a question back to Kamala, and that's a reaction to your last question, Christian. What does the future bring? Kamala made reference to this issue of additionality of the um, export credits. I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Kamala, that that's related to this term of um, that the export credit agencies intervene where the market doesn't function, where the, the, the risk is not marketable anymore. Now, on a recent panel 10 days ago on export credits, I was told by the export credit agency, we are intervening more and more and more because the non-marketable risk has increased due to the crisis. And on the same panel, I had a major global insurer who told me, oh, we are intervening more and more and more, and we help the public export credit agencies to deal with their bigger portfolio. So on the one hand, the public entity tells me risk is not marketable anymore, on the other hand, a private sector player intervenes to help the public agency. So when I come back to your question, Chris, uh, question, Christian, what does the future bring? Um, I'm a bit concerned about how public and private play together there on the private on the financial side. And I would be happy to hear Kamala's views on this. Uh, yeah, you're you're absolutely right, Marion. Uh, you know, it's blended finance. In fact, what what they try and do is export credit agencies also try and work with development finance institutions as well as with the private sector to do what they call crowding in. So it's a new way of thinking. Well, let's try and fill this financing gap. Um, and you know, there's a good logic behind it. If the private sector think that it's a good enough risk because a, a government's involved, then they're more likely to get in. And we're talking about developing countries and least developing countries, medium to long term uh, loans uh, support. So there is there is a rationale behind trying to crowd in the private sector. My real problem is, apart from the US, nobody is telling us how they actually check additionality. 
Nobody is saying, well, this is what we do. This is our evaluation. The same goes for economic, social, human rights. Nobody, um, environmental, social, human rights. Nobody is saying, well, this is at this point, we initiate an impact assessment report because this is our criteria for determining whether it's a risky project. It's all self-reporting. So the UK export credit agencies support fossil fuels projects at the same time as signing up to Paris Agreement, at the same time as going for zero uh, emissions, suddenly, whoop, out of nowhere, we have a fossil fuel project. So my whole, my whole problem is the fact that the, the lack of transparency means that nobody is accountable. We don't see where, where, whether there's additionality. We don't see whether they're adhering to OECD guidelines. Um, it's all about taking faith of, of governments at a time when governments are, are operating very much in um, autarkic uh, and individualistic ways. So I think all of these mechanisms work quite well in good times. But in the bad times, there, there are so many loopholes and this whole idea of blended finance and crowding in and crowding out. How is economists, lawyers, policy analysts, are we supposed to get our finger behind what's going on? Uh, so, it, so it is a real problem, and I do believe that the public sector is competing with the private sector. It's as simple as that. It's, it's, it's not about additionality if your mandate is to compete with other export credit agencies. Oh, one last point on antitrust and competition. Now, in the EU, export credit support short term falls under the state aid rules. Medium to long term, whoop. OECD, soft law, self-reporting. What's going on there? Thank you. Would anyone like to react to this? Um, in that case, I think uh, we'll move on to the, the next and I think uh, final question, which comes again from Ronald Steenblick. And he questions whether um, it's always the, the winning rationale to start with a group of big economies for um, uh, policy projects. Um, his example is that the fishery subsidies negotiations have dragged on for decades. And he contrasts this um, with the agreement on climate change trade and sustainability, where six smaller members have uh, developed disciplines on fossil fuel subsidies and whether this uh, offers an interesting alternative approach. So, um, do we have any comments from the panelists? Um, uh, I think when we say that we need the bigger players to engage by simply saying that because those are the major subsidizers so without them any future disciplines would not be so meaningful uh, i mean it is like the like we establish a cage and trying to put the dogs into it and then we're leaving the big ones out as so continue to cause problem but the reality now is that as i described in the beginning about political context it's hard to foresee uh, the big guys to see eye to eye and try to embark uh, on a meaningful discussion. So that's something we have to deal with, but uh, we cannot wait. As I said in a, a few days, uh, at another pa panel uh, simply is that uh, the middle grounders should be more proactive and trying to play the role uh, by leading because they don't have to wait for the big guys to, to do everything. They themselves could uh, could uh, do 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 more by 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 establishing among themselves the kind of disciplines which they think will be important and hopefully in the future the big guys could join i think uh, you, you know, he mentioned the climate change and others and also another thing which i mentioned uh, uh, at that panel as an example is the uh, on the digital economy i mean the recently dpad so so digital economic partnership by by chile singapore and new zealand and those were smaller uh, um, middle grounders, uh, which has done excellent work by doing that. And they uh, they say that that agreement remains to open to be sponsored by others who are interested in joining. So I think that uh, these are two triangles of the same issue, but we 
by saying it's important to engage play in uh, the big players doesn't mean that we wait until they, they see eye to eye. No, that's not what uh, at least uh, I mean. Thanks. Shall I? Yeah, if you want. Thank yeah. You. Yeah, so just to follow up on what uh, Shanku was saying. So what part of the uh, the question makes a reference to this uh, New Zealand uh, led initiative on an agreement on climate change trade and sustainability right and that is explicitly designed as an open plurilateral agreement right i mean and, and this is kind of the core <coughs> of what's what what they're trying to do and what they're also trying to do is to explicitly kind of address this issue of where does trade and trade policy disciplines where does that fit into efforts to actually abide and, and, and um, realize climate change uh, types of commitments that governments have taken. And I think that is a really innovative and a really useful, and I think it's a necessary type of approach to take. And I think it's exactly what at least some of the big countries should be doing, right, and joining that. Now, under the current situation in the United States, the United States is not going to do this anytime soon, hopefully, well, hopefully sooner rather than later. But I think the key actor here that I would like to see, and I would advocate kind of joining that initiative is the European Union, right? Because the European Union has the Green Deal as front and center in terms of what um, it's going to be working on under the current Commission. And the European Union has said that border carbon adjustments are going to be part of what the European Union is going to be doing in terms of enforcing, kind of an implementing an arrangement that goes um, in terms of achieving the objectives of reducing carbon emissions, achieving the objectives that are going to be laid out in this Green Deal. So, and to do that, I think you cannot do that unilaterally, right? And I think this is recognized in the Commission, but this ACCTS discussion actually offers the right type of framework to think about these types of issues, right? So I think I would very much hope to see a large player like the European Union bring in these countries that are like-minded and that are interested in actually working out what the rules of the game should be but at the same time, also bringing in countries that are not necessarily like-minded, right? Because I think it's equally important to consider what countries that are not like-minded, what they, what their concerns are. So I think we need to work on these two tracks. And I think that's why it's absolutely critical that an arrangement like this, this these ongoing negotiations, right? So there is no agreement yet. This is an ongoing negotiation on climate change, trade and sustainability, that it is really open so that everybody actually knows what is being done. Right now, it's early days for that negotiation, uh, but I would very much stress the need for transparency, openness, and for a large player like the European Union to actually join that, because that would really make it uh, obviously a lot more meaningful. But I think it would also be very useful for the union itself in terms of thinking through how we need to design the trade policy elements of what we're going to be doing uh, to implement a Green Deal in a way that it doesn't, you know, come across as, okay, this is us setting the rules of the game and the rest of the world is going to have to do what we think is the right thing to do. Thanks. Uh, it doesn't seem like we have any other comments on this from the panel unless I see some movement now. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left until we need to wrap up this session. So um, I think I would like to give all our panelists the opportunity to sort of conclude um, this session and maybe what their main takeaways of this uh, discussion are. Um, there's been a last question, which I think is quite interesting. So I think I'd like to drop that there. And if you like, you can pick this up in your closing statements, um, which is how should we deal with services subsidies? Um, as Guts is not nearly as uh, elaborated and concrete as uh, the agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures, 
um, how, how would we go about this? So I suggest we um, go about this in the same way that we started. So we would start off with Bernard, then Marianne Janssen, Kamala Dawar, and uh, uh, no, then then Jan uh, Ru, and then finally Kamala Dawar. Uh, Bernard, you want to come in? Okay, so just in closing, I would reiterate the need to actually fill this information gap that everybody has been talking about and to really start thinking seriously about how to actually do that, right? So how do you actually create a mandate for the international organizations to do this? I think the only kind of, for me, the most obvious uh, focal point for this is the G20 and the Trade and Investment Working Group. An alternative is to do this through an OPA type of framework, an open plurilateral agreement framework, where we have like-minded countries who get together and who say, okay, we will put the resources in to actually do this. Um, so those are the two options I see for moving this forward. Unfortunately, I don't see the WTO secretariat doing this, although that really is the place where it should be done. And then the dialogue analysis, and I think doing much more in the way of collective thinking about how can we move away from this hard rule, you know, judicial kind of focal point for thinking about everything, putting it into treaties, to other types of mechanisms to actually get um, and to support cooperation. And I would agree completely with Marion that not only do we need more economists to be part of this equation, we need better <laughs> economists to this equation. But that, of course, is a whole different uh, panel in itself, because it does boil back to uh, the question of how are economists trained nowadays, and is that the right way to do it? Brief word on the services. So I think services is a really good example of these two elements, right? Because services policies are still largely a black box, right? And that's not just the case for subsidies. It even is the case for trade policy, right? So the WTO and the World Bank have just come out with the latest edition of their services trade restrictiveness indicators, right? So that was just published uh, this year. That data pertains to 2016, right? So it's already five years out of date, and it only covers 23 developing countries, I think, off the top of my head, right? So there is a huge gap right there. Most of the data on services trade restrictiveness comes from the OECD, and we have this basically, you know, all these black spots on the map when it comes to what's going on in developing countries. So, it, and then that applies even more, of course, when it comes to subsidies. So again, I would start with filling that transparency gap is critical. Thanks. Um, yeah, by take over here from uh, Bernard at the uh, OECD, we will um, continue in this um, with our work on providing information on subsidies. And I would like you maybe like to use the opportunity to say that putting out the data already involves analysis because uh, often you have uh, there are decisions behind how you combine different types of data and how you assess them. And that's notably um, quite clear in our work on, on the services trade restrictiveness indices that, um, that Bernard made reference to. Um, so, as I said, the work that we've been doing for decades sometimes on agriculture, fisheries, fossil fuels will continue. Um, in industrial goods, we have a very active agenda on understanding better how subsidies work through the value chain. Um, there the work is really often value chain, is value chain specific, but we are also now looking uh, horizontally at how different types of uh, financial measures, how they are designed and how their design influences, how they work through the value value chain. So this is a very active area of work that combines um, both analysis and um, and collection of data and making the data available. And I would like to finish by thanking members for helping us with this, because ultimately many of these data are provided to us by national authorities and different types of national authorities. And without their help, when it goes beyond uh, OECD members in many of these areas, 
without the help of those national um, authorities, national institutions, we would not be able to provide the information and the transparency that we need and that other speakers have been referring to. So I close with a thank you to those who are helping us in this effort. Thank you, Christian. Uh, no, this definitely is a top issue that should be dealt with sooner than later. And I, I, one thing you have mentioned in your introduction that this should also be a top issue for the incoming DG and to see how this could be brought into his or her agenda as soon as possible. Uh, the way forward, um, as we have discussed, I think we need a really holistic process ahead. We need a kind of pol policy, uh, political dialogue, as I said. Uh, we need better information, better analysis, as uh, all the other panelists have said. Uh, we need more engagement from other NG uh, IGOs, international organization uh, uh, with the WTO. And of course, as Marianne said, that uh, we need uh, better economists uh, to do more analysis. That won't include me, of course, I know. Uh, we need also more coverage, including services and agriculture, so on and so forth. Uh, on the political dialogue, one extra element I said, I think Bernard more or less mentioned this, I think that uh, given that the US and China tension, I think you should, or should try to play a kind of bridging role there. I think that's the, what we hear a lot in Geneva about the EU should take a, a, a more a leadership a leadership role, uh, not only with the US, but with other, also other small, smaller middle grounders and trying to do uh, some more open polylaterals and trying to start this kind of discussion and move the way forward and hopefully to engage more and more in the future. Thank you. Um, I think I want to direct attention more onto national governments because I spend a lot of my time hassling international organizations for data and they tell me they're just not allowed to give it to me. Um, I'm fed up with having to ask for freedom of information requests from national governments to get information from my government that I'm dem democratically uh, elected. Uh, to get freedom of information, I have to know what to ask for. That's a huge academic issue in itself. You have to ask for something. If you don't know what to ask for, you don't get the information. Transparency of evaluations at national level. Impact assessments, I want to see those. The EU is good. It puts them out there. We can have a look. I think national governments should all be presenting this information for the public good. So the academic civil society can actually look at what's going on and how they evaluate their subsidies. Thank you very much. So in a nutshell, what I take away is we need new rules, but in order to, to find these rules, we need more transparency, we need less secrecy around data, and we need much better economies. Um, I Thank the panel very much for their contributions. It was a pleasure to have all of you there. I have learned a lot and uh, that was, yeah, thank you very much. I really enjoyed this panel. Um, there is a chance to continue this uh, conversation on the uh, platform of the Geneva Trade Week. Um, there is a link in the chat box, which you can click if you'd like to do that. That goes for all panelists, but also for the audience. Um, and with that, I wish you a nice Friday and a very nice weekend. Goodbye. Thank you very much. <laughs>